Good morning, everyone, and welcome to ICE 365 Live, the only place for exclusive access to the show floor here at ICE London. My name is Katie Goldfinch, and I'll be your eyes and ears at XL London, bringing you industry-leading interviews, the latest launches and deals from ICE, and more across the week. As you can see, the studio has had a refresh this year and we've a few of last year's guests returning, as well as a lot of new but well-known industry faces joining us. And this year's ICE is on track to be the biggest ever. There are a record 68 nations represented on the show floor this year, across 623 exhibitors in total, occupying 51,466 square metres of space. The audience to this year's show is made up predominantly of gaming operators at 45% of attendees, followed by 44% suppliers and 11% other industry stakeholders. So there really is no better place to do business than ICE London 2023. And there's a lot going on. The Consumer Protection Zone has grown yet again and is now an award winner, taking home the responsible approach to advertising and marketing trophy at the 2022 Global Regulatory Awards. At Pitch Ice, you'll be able to see 14 startups looking to disrupt the industry. And the esports arena is back to showcase leading female esports athletes from the She Sports Cup franchise. Alongside all the returning features, you'll also find something brand Brand new, the Street Gaming Hub. This is being run in partnership with the Gambling Business Group and will feature high street gaming brands such as Novomatic UK, Entain, Buzz Bingo, Murky UK, and Game Nation. Up in the capital suites, this year's sold-out Icebox conference is already underway and the likes of the UK Department of Culture, Media and Sport Casinos Austria, Virgin Voyages, Amazon and the American Gaming Association taking the stage yesterday. And live from stand S9 110 and through ice365.com, we'll be welcoming a number of special guests over the next three days. It's a packed program and slightly different this year with each stream featuring a different market focus. On Thursday, you'll hear from leading operators from Europe and there'll be a Latin American focus on Wednesday afternoon after a series of discussions on interviews on Great Britain that morning. This afternoon, we're turning our attention stateside to look at the US industry. But this morning, we're taking a global view of the market. We've got H2 Gambling Capital back in the studio to discuss the financial health of the industry, as well as some high-profile investors to discuss products, markets and technology that are worth backing. We'll also be cutting live to the opening ceremony of ICE London and welcoming back eGaming Monitor to discuss the state of slots in 2023. But we kick off with two of last year's guests. Last year, Andrew and Ben from Inside Asian Gaming joined us by video link. But this year, we're delighted to have them in person in the studio. Welcome back, Ben and Andrew. Tell us how it feels to be back at ICE London and take it away with the Asian headlines. Well, thank you very much, Katie. It's fantastic to actually be here physically in person instead of uh, uh, online as we were last year uh, due to the situation in Asia with COVID. And it's been a, quite a ride in Asia over the last few years. And we've been a little bit slower than the rest of uh, the world to recover from COVID, but we're, we're back now. And Ben and I are absolutely excited to be here in London. So uh, let's start off with talking about Macau. Today, we'll focus a fair bit on Macau and tomorrow, we might, uh, tomorrow morning, will do uh, the rest of Asia. So maybe over to you, Ben, to tell us about the reopening of Macau in terms of how it's gone the last few weeks. Sure, well, I mean, as many of uh, the viewers would know, Macau has been uh, probably the slowest to recover of any jurisdiction, any major jurisdiction around the world. Uh, Macau and, and mainland China have been essentially closed for three years. And obviously Macau suffered greatly through that, um, down to record level, record lows really of GGR of around US 5 billion last year, um, which was unheard of pre-COVID, that sort of level. Um, but out of the blue almost, uh, very rapidly, China, uh, mainland China and therefore Macau reopened their borders, essentially dropped all COVID restrictions on the 8th of January this year. And Macau has boomed back uh, incredibly fast, more, uh, faster than I think anybody expected. Well, January gross gaming revenue results were released uh, only a few days ago. Uh, so revenue for Macau for January alone this year was uh, MOP 11.6 billion, which is around about 1.5 billion US, uh, which is a stunning recovery from where we were a month ago, Andrew. 
Absolutely amazing, uh, especially considering that it wasn't even a full month. Uh, it was January the 8th that uh, Macau reopened, and it was literally like turning a light switch on. They just rushed back. Um, Chinese New Year in that period as well, and we in the four day, first four days of Chinese New Year, we had 30,000, 50,000, 70,000, and 90,000 visitors. The average visitation being 108,000 uh, per day in 2019. But don't be fooled by that because the players that were coming back really were genuine hardcore players. Uh, no tyre kickers, no uh, tour group people just wearing out the carpet. It really was real play. So yeah, very, very interesting to see that 11.5 billion mop figure, divide by, that by eight to get to US dollars. So as you say, 1.5 uh, billion really only in three, uh, three weeks, not, uh, not four weeks. And I might just like to do a little bit of analysis on that. Uh, in 2019, the last full year before the pandemic, uh, the GGR was around 36 and a half billion US dollars, but about about 20 billion of that was uh, was mass gaming, and the remainder, about 16 and a half billion, was VIP. And the the margins for the operators on mass are about five or six times as much as the margins on VIP. So in fact, on the mass play that we had in January, uh, if you do some sums and analysis on it, it works out that it was a little bit over 100% of the level of 2019. So it just came back instantly, which was quite amazing. Now, Macau's had problems with junkets, which we don't have time to go into today, but the VIP play is basically wiped, almost wiped out. But there was very little EBITDA on that for the, uh, for the operators. So in fact, it's not going to take a much more GGR in February. And this has continued, what we've seen in January has continued in February already. Uh, not going to take much more and we're, we're back to where we were. I think that's the interesting thing is that obviously January was aided by Chinese New Year, uh, so good timing. Obviously Chinese New Year is traditionally the busiest time of year for Macau. Uh, everybody comes into Macau and, and revenues soar during Chinese New Year, uh, but there's usually a drop off straight after Chinese New Year naturally. But what we've seen this year and what the analysts are talking about is that even into uh, the early days of February, the past five or six days of February, the revenue has stayed the same. It's even slightly exceeded the January average. I think it's at around mop 380 million a day, so a little shy of US 50 million a day. So that's great signs for Macau that we're not seeing a drop off. In fact, the pent up demand seems to be sustaining this recovery and possibly going northwards in the future. Well, that pent up demand um, coming through, obviously some people can't come through on day one, they've got to come through on day two or week two or week three, that's uh, overcompensating for the drop off after Chinese New Year. Typically third day of Chinese New Year is the biggest one. And also just another thing on Macau as well, we should mention that the concessionaires, the six companies there um, that are concessionaires, not license holders, they're actually concessionaires, uh, all got their licenses or their concessions I should say, uh, renewed uh, on the 1st of January this year for 10 years. So that is a whole new beginning for Macau now. There was a lot of concern over whether they would have their uh, concessions renewed or not. Uh, and there was an, uh, another company came in and tried to win a concession but didn't. So now they have this whole new beginning lasting for 10 years from January 1 uh, this year through to 31st of December 2032. So a, new, a completely new beginning for Macau, an exciting be beginning for Macau. And um, it looks like, uh, as a jurisdiction, it could be back after uh, three years of just absolutely you know, devastating, uh, terrible uh, financial results. I've got two questions for you, Andrew. I mean, you've been, you, you live in Macau. You've, you didn't leave Macau for three years, essentially. You were stuck yeah. there in 30 square kilometres. Uh, and, and obviously, it was very quiet, a very different Macau to normal. But you, wrote, you left Macau only a few days ago. You were there. Can you talk about what it was like on the streets to see people coming back into Macau, how busy was it? It was amazing. Macau has basically been like a post-apocalyptic movie there for a while and to see all those people back was just absolutely fantastic and it just felt like the old days and there was a real buzz and excitement on the streets of Macau. The casinos were full, there was money being, you know, a lot of money on the tables, it was just great to see. Sure. And, and we mentioned obviously the, the renewal or the, the re-tendering and obviously the new 10-year concessions. What, what are the main changes for the concessionaires for this new 10-year period as opposed to the previous 20-year period? Right, well, there's a very, very big focus on non-gaming. So the, the government has actually uh, made the concessionaires commit to no less than $13.5 billion US spend over the next 10 years, which when you do the sums comes out to be 4.4 million US dollars per concessionaire 
per week for a decade. So they're going to be spending a lot of money on building up non-gaming through programming and through building of assets um, for the, you know, the non-gaming uh, part. Of, so they're trying to convert Macau a little bit more into a Las Vegas than traditionally what it's been in the past, which has just been purely a gambling centre. You, you speak to the concessionaires regularly, we both do. Um, what's their general view on this non-gaming push and, and how they're viewing the next few years, their, their sort of immediate plans in that, in that sense? So I think they're trying to get um, as much return as they can on that 13.5 billion US dollars as they can. They see that as a commitment that they had to put out there in order to get those concessions uh, renewed for 10 years. And they're trying to think, well, how can we commit to what the government wants, but not lose as much of that as possible. So roughly about, it seems about half of that money is going into what they term programming. So by programming, we mean um, you know, creating entertainment, getting uh, world-class stars to come in, uh, do things in Macau, create attractions, that sort of thing. And the other half they're spending on basically things that could be, they could put on a balance sheet, bricks and mortar, assets, you know, whatever you might like to dream up, wet and wild water parks, uh, art galleries, museums, uh, redevelopment of uh, old areas of Macau even. Some of these things are not even on the premises of the, the resorts themselves. So I think their focus is having committed to this very, very large spend over the next decade is how can we spend that money and frankly try not to lose much of it at all you know and it may be in fact Rob Goldstein the chairman and CEO of Las Vegas Sands came out recently and says he believes he can actually turn a profit on that spend which you know would be pretty amazing in Macau given the propensity of Chinese to gamble rather than to go and do other things. Now you mentioned earlier that we wouldn't go too much into the VIP junket situation. We probably should touch on it because it, it is very relevant as we head into 2023. It's been a very eventful past few years in that junket space. Of course we saw the arrests of Sun City CEO Alvin Chow, the arrest of uh, Tuck Chun CEO Levo Chan. Uh, Alvin Chow was only very recently sentenced to 18 years in prison for his um, role with junkets and various accusations along that line. But it has really changed the landscape for Macau, and of course we've seen a new junket law passed in the past uh, six months as well uh, relating to that. Uh, can you talk us through a little bit about um, what those main changes are and how that affects the VIP space in Macau? So the history of this goes actually back to the days of um, Stanley Ho and, and Liz Bower and pre the two, 2000 concessions back to the 1990s. And he got people to basically get players to bring them in from China. And that evolved into the junkets that we know of today. So you had these junket operators that were effectively as powerful as concessionaires themselves with their own rev share rooms almost being like unlicensed operators. And these companies became very, very big, very, very powerful and able to control play and move it from operator to operator. And I think as, as time has gone on and as the industry has evolved, the regulator and the, uh, the Macau government as well has seen that as not a good thing for Macau. These, these companies didn't go through the probity checks that the concessionaires went through. Some of them had murky pasts and, 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 and you know, dubious histories. And it was time to crack down on that industry and crack down they have. And some would argue that crack down is probably a little bit too harsh, but it's very, very clear that that part of the industry is not going to play a part in Macau moving forward over the next decade. As you say, the, the biggest operator there, the biggest junket operator there, uh, Sun City and the, the boss, uh, Alvin Chow, recently sentenced to 18 years in prison for various, um, various uh, crimes, mainly, uh, mainly you know, under the table betting uh, was the predominant one. And um, you know, that's, that's, that's a thing of the past in Macau now and will not be coming back. There, is a, there are still junkets in Macau, but they're way back to what they were in the 1990s, what they have, not what they evolved into in the 2010s. And they're just smaller guys who maybe operate with one operator and receive a commission on turnover and rolling rather than these enormous casinos within casinos that we saw develop over that sort of period from 2005 through to 2020. Yeah, you know, I think uh, uh, it's a very exciting time for Macau. I mean, I think when all this junket situation went down that people were questioning, uh, you know, where we're going to go from here, but we've got the 10 key concessions are in place now. The government is cleaning up the, the perhaps the grey side of the industry and moving forward very positively, Andrew. So, you know, obviously we'll be coming back tomorrow to talk more about the rest of Asia, but uh, I think positive signs for Macau.
Absolutely. So it's a whole new ball game for Macau, and you know, some of the analysts have been very pessimistic or bearish on Macau, but they're not now. We've been really surprised with how quickly it's come back. So, yeah, that's it for Macau, and we'll talk more about the rest of Asia uh, tomorrow, and we'll see you uh, tomorrow at ICE 365 uh, Live. We're very happy to be back, as I said before, and we'll see you tomorrow when we talk about the rest of Asia. Thank you.